and going to 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1. And this is Peter. He was just talking about Noah. In chapter 3, he was just talking about how water saved Noah. We'll get into those verses later on. But after he wraps that all up and he talks about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, he says something. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves. Everybody say, arm yourselves. Arm yourselves, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. That's why I entitled this message, Armed and Dangerous. We actually arm ourselves with a certain way of thinking, a certain mind, an understanding. And why are we able to arm ourselves with the same mind as what Christ had when he suffered for us, for us in the flesh? He said, for he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. And in other words, Christ suffered for us. And how many know when Jesus died for us, that was us dying, right? And that's how we can arm ourselves. Because of what he experienced when he suffered, he's conquered it, he's over sin and death now, he's got victory over it. Can you imagine Jesus being tempted with sin and, and him falling to it in his resurrection state? How many know he was tempted? He's tempted in the wilderness. And you're not tempted unless it really appeals to you. If Jesus just said, devil, everything you're saying doesn't touch me, doesn't affect me, it doesn't have any desire in me whatsoever to fulfill what you're saying, he wouldn't have been tempted. He would have said, your offers do not tempt me. But he was tempted. And after he died and resurrected and had immortal humanity, then that was even more victory in Jesus Christ. You can't imagine Jesus committing sin before he went to that cross. But the fact is that after he did resurrect from the dead, he was actually in a, still in humanity, but it was an immortal humanity. It was what God wanted man to have from the beginning, but he lost it. And so now it's saying that we have joined with him. And now we can take what he had in my, his mind. He understood that when he was going to die, he knew he was going to resurrect. How many remember what Hebrews said? For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. And now is set down at the right hand of God in heaven. Can, and going to that cross, he had that all in mind. I'm going to rise from the dead. I'm going to be sitting on that throne. I'm going to be glorified King of kings and Lord of lords. And he said, arm yourselves with the same mind. So I want us to pray right now that this message will really get a hold of us. I, I really prayed, I really sought God for this message. This is the last one of the year. For what would be in our hearts as a congregation to go into next year. So let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, God, open everybody's heart, I pray. I pray, allow a grace of focus to be upon each of us. That we would receive everything spoken. Nothing would distract. Satan, I bind your power. I command every influence of hell to leave this place entirely. Amen. And in Jesus' name, God, let angels be around us like a wall of fire. And I pray, God, as we speak, let these words go out of my mouth on the wings of your spirit with such anointing, God, that it pierces every single heart, opens our understanding so that no one here has missed anything you've wanted us to know. And we give you the glory for it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen, amen. Now, it's like the church has really matured down through the centuries. I remember just through the decades, just a few decades ago, all we ever heard was, get a hold of the Lord, get saved, and when you are saved, hold on so you can go to heaven. And uh, don't slip away to them. Get other people in. And how many know those are huge, huge things that we still need to always do? But there was never much between getting saved and going to heaven that was dealt with. It's like, hold on, hold on. But the church has grown and it's matured. And now God's opening it up and getting people into a, a, 
and understanding, digging into some of the things that normally, I don't understand that, I'll just skip by that. And, and I don't know if you, you were like this, but when I, just after I got saved, and granted I was called to the ministry, it's a little different situation perhaps in some degrees, but I, I started looking at things, and one thing that really hit out to me, I'm never hearing Romans 6. What's Romans 6 talking about? Like, what's that mean? And, the, and then Romans 7, the good that I would, I do not, and the evil which I would not, that I do. If then I do that which I would not, it is not me that will do with it. But, you know, it kind of was boggling my mind. And, and so I sought the Lord, and from experience, I can guarantee you, if you have something you look at in the Word, you don't understand it, pray. God, open this up to me. And what I want to talk about is that very thing, because I realized there was so much value in what Paul was talking about in these epistles that it deals with between the time you get saved and you go to heaven. It gives you victory now. Somebody say now. Hallelujah. And I was so thrilled. My mother-in-law, I remember when I first met my wife, and we'd be sitting, at my, her mother and I, and get around the Bible at the table and talk and talk, and she had such a hunger, and God used her. God would give her visions, and, and she'd see things in the Spirit. And... Uh, it was one of her brothers had some kind of one of these rock albums with a big serpent on the cover of it and he was playing that up in her, her, his room and, and it's like my mother went to him and said, it's like there's a snake in this house. What are you doing? And God had showed her what was going on. And then when Mike had this uh, accident at West or something, that very night she had a dream and glass and blood or something in a car and she just took the praying, something like that, and then found out he was in a serious accident right around that time. And, uh, but I was thinking, getting in and getting hungry, getting answers, wanting to have victory now. And, and I, I think about how we can have struggles within our own lives as Christians. Some people have got a bad temper, and it always seems to be there. And then there's other issues. It's... it's Lust, somebody might be struggling with lust and all these things. And the Bible tells us we don't have to struggle with those things. There is power against it. And we've got to learn. And so when I was praying and seeking God, I said, God, give me something that will take us into 2020. The focus. I remember talking with a young man that was a friend of my son. And he said to me, he said, there must be more to this. There must be more to the cross. I know Jesus died for me, and I know, you know, we're saved because of that. But, and then I said, well, you know what? There is more. We died with Jesus on that cross. Did you ever look at it like that? And we, I was just starting out shallow with it. And, and we were also buried and risen with him. And Ephesians says, that Paul prayed for the whole church of Ephesus. Probably the deepest book in the Bible is the little book of Ephesians. It probably is the most deep book there is. He, he talked to the Corinthians about their dress and their modesty and money and their offerings and idolizing preachers and even hair, for goodness sake. <laughs> and he had to deal with flesh. That's why he said at the very beginning of the book, he said, I, I can't talk to you as spiritual people, but like babies, you're taking each other to court. And, and he said, we're going to judge angels, for goodness sake. What are you doing taking each other to court? How in the world are you going to have enough authority to judge angels with you can't even get along with one another and you got to take each other to court you settle these things get a hold of god get the church together and deal with some of these issues so corinthians is a, i mean they were talking in tongues and never gave any chance for anybody hardly to move sideways and he said look if i speak ten thousand words in in another tongue it what good is i'd sooner speak five words in my native tongue than ten thousand words in another tongue that you're not going to understand and I've been in circles like that where tongues is going on and people are hollering and shouting and everything. And it just, Paul said, they'll come in and think you're mad. And how many know it's real? You do that. There's nothing wrong with it. But he said, get, when you get together, edify each other, get built up. And so he didn't have to deal with that stuff with the Ephesians. He just went right into it. And he said, what I'm praying now, the next level for this church in Ephesus is God to open your eyes to let you understand that you were raised with Christ and seated on that throne. 
And as surveying the message as we preach through the years here, and then moving on, going even higher now with God, how many want to go further? Get more victory, more understanding, get closer to God, be used by God more. Then I thought about how this is it, this is it. If we're seated with Christ, and we kept that and armed our minds with that, I not just died with him. I I was buried, risen, and I'm seated on his throne with him. If we armed our minds with that when we face attacks, there's just no way we could get defeated. We just say, no, wait a minute. I died with him. I'm buried. I'm risen. I'm seated. I'm enthroned with him. What is this thing I'm facing now compared to the enthronement dominion that I have in Jesus Christ? And that would just put adrenaline into your faith. You'd look at Satan. You'd bind his spirits and his demons. And you'd go after him. I remember a man was getting a hold of this back in the church in Newfoundland years ago in the early 90s. And, and he talked about how David pursued after the enemy. How many like to turn the tables around instead of the devil chasing us, we go around chasing him? You talk about being devil chaser? Yes. <laughs> Pursue the little rascal. And get victory over him. And so, yes, we got to tell people you can get away from hell. But you that are already saved from hell, you that are already going to heaven, you've got to get a growth and an understanding that if you've got a problem with lust, you can get victory over it. You can stamp it out. If you've got a problem with anger and, and you fuss with people and fights break out all the time, you've got to get victory over that. If, if there's people that... Something happened between you and you can't forgive. You've got to get forgiveness in your heart and conquer that lack of forgiveness. And oh, look at our lives, look at our lives and and see what it is that, that needs to be overcome. Because if we're all the time dealing with our own struggles, when somebody comes into the kingdom of God and they've got real needs, how are we ever going to be able to minister to them? When we can't even get over our own issues. Praise God. So let's get a clear picture of where we want to go. How many want to go deeper? I want to try to share from what I've studied in the Word of God what the goal, let me put it like this, the gospel for the believer is. The gospel for, now let me warn you now. So you, it, it's easy to fall to the temptation that when you read something like Romans 6 and chapter 7, and it's just boggling your mind. I just want to be ready to go to heaven. I don't need to know that stuff. And the pastor gets going into areas we're not familiar with. Just tune it out. And somebody, I even heard a minister once make a statement like this. I just want, if I'm in trouble, I'm in a tree, there's a snake going to bite me, I don't need a big, huge, lengthy explanation of how to overcome them. I just need to get out of there now. Now. It's got to be fast. Give me some fast food truth right there because I'm going to need it right away. You've got to be prepared before that happens. And there's just no way around it. Living this kind of victory that I'm going to describe this morning, it's not something you can quickly learn. There's so much of a change of thinking that you've just got to commit yourself, okay? I've just got to roll up my sleeve and dive into this and get this in my heart. It's so different from the way we've lived before we were saved. It's so different that you can go for years and never really change from the way you lived before you were saved. The only difference is you're you're Christian now. You're saved. And you might not go to the places you used to go to and and say the type of language you used to give and how many know that needs to be changed. But you've got to buckle down and, and not handle life the way the world does that doesn't even know. They, they, they've got their this and they've got that and they've got ways to handle their solutions. They've got doctors and psychiatrists and, and we even depend on that to a degree. But there's a huge element they don't have. A God that they can go to. A body of Christ that they can be part of. To unite together. To learn the things of God and realize I've got more ammunition that I've never even realized on me now than I'd ever hoped to have need of. It's, it's, we've got more. It's all there. 
So here it is. Somebody say the gospel for the Christian. I am crucified with Christ. Everybody agree with that? That's amen, isn't it? But here's the part that Paul came into that we need to move into. Nevertheless, I live. Now, it's almost like he made a mistake and said, yet not I. Notice that? He said, I'm living, but wait a minute, yet not I. He wrote that like that on purpose. He wanted to actually say, I'm living. And then he wanted to kind of contradict and say, yet not I, because he's driving home a point. But Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul cast devils out of people, and boom, those devils went out as soon as he commanded it. I've been involved in deliverance, and sometimes it's been a struggle. But Paul was so full of an armed mind, he knew who he was in Christ, and more importantly, he knew who Christ was in him. That he spoke to that damsel with that divin spirit of divination and said, come out of her in the name of Jesus, and it was gone like that. It wasn't wrestling for hours. He spoke the word, and boom, it was gone. Uh, he went forth and made a statement in 1 Corinthians 15. I, I die daily. I die daily. And I know the common idea associated with that is, yeah, we die daily. We gotta, we're crucified every day with Christ. That's not what Paul was saying. That's far from it. What Paul was saying is he said, every day I get up, I could die. And I know it. Today might be my day. And he talks about the perils that he suffered the jeopardy that his ministry was in. One time they were coming to take him and they let him out of a window in a basket and he fled for his life. They, they stoned him once and thought that he was dead and walked away and Paul got back up and went on preaching again. He said, I was beaten five times with rods for being a preacher. One time is supposed to stop you. Five times never stopped me. I was in a shipwreck preaching stoned and and he said i was caught up to heaven is probably when he was stoned and how could a guy say i'm perplexed but i'm not cast down I'm, I'm persecuted but i'm not destroyed so much so that the church in corinth got so concerned for him he had to write to them don't be worried about me he says i'm not broken by this it's actually bringing more of an anointing out of me. How could a man come to the understanding? People have often scratched their heads and said, Paul's a, he's a sucker for punishment. <laughs> he said, I glory in tribulation. <laughs> what, how could a guy glory in tribulation? He had his head, his mind armed. He knew what it meant. He knew how things worked. He knew that the persecution coming against him would just take his flesh and in a sense break it down so that the anointing of God would come out of him more. Has anybody prayed and fasted and experienced that? We're just entering into a prayer and fast. You feel the glory come all over. You're, you're so sensitive to hear God speak. It's like as soon as you start praying, boom, the world's off your back and you're in the holiest of holies. We're normally... You're praying and it's such a struggle. You can barely get through five minutes and somebody might say, well, I, I thought that's the most you should ever pray, five minutes. Oh, you haven't prayed if that's what you... When you get into the Spirit in a time of prayer, the time goes. We've been hours at different times in the Spirit, just in the Spirit. And, and you come out of that and, and it affects you. You're sensitive to the Holy Ghost. I forget who it was, Moody, one of these guys... Um, down in the States, he was with somebody. He'd walk into a, a factory, and a holiness would go through that house. And, and he was standing out the side of a dirt road, and there was a farmer out there. He just looked at him and just started praying, and he saw the guy take his hat off, get down on his knees right in the field. Like the glory of God that was coming out of him. And this is what Paul meant. He said, I am alive after my crucifixion. But let me narrow it down and let me explain a little more. It's not really me. It's Christ that's in me that's living now. And, and religion is just 
One man wrote a book, The Imitation of Christ, trying to imitate. That's not it. That's not what Paul was saying. It's not imitating Jesus. It's letting Christ who's in you now live through you. And when he was located on the cross, how many know what I mean when he was dying as us? Right? You got it. When he was located physically on that cross, he was dying as us. It counted as our deaths. Well, where is he now? We know he's in glory. We know he's on the throne. But there's somewhere special that he is also right now. We, Galatians just said it. He's in us. And now that he's located in us, he's physically in us, he wants to live as us. And in other words, you ever heard that old Dottie Rambo song? Flow through me, Holy Spirit. There's a lonely soul that needs just one friend to care. So flow through me. Lord, you're in me now. Live through me. Let your love go through me. We did that praying for Amanda as understanding that he's the vine and we're the branches. And the sap comes out of that vine in through that branch. And if that branch wasn't connected to that vine, there would be no fruit. And Jesus spoke about that. Without me, branch without the vine, you can do nothing. No fruit's going to grow. And he said, what good is a branch that's not connected to the vine that it would bring forth fruit? It's worthy for nothing more than taking away and throwing it in the fire. But he says, through me, you can do all things. And so when we look at the monsters and the giants in the land of Canaan and all the walls and the lives that equate to what we go through in 2019... And we realize we're not big enough to handle that. Whoever said we were. But there's a God living inside of us. Jesus Christ. Who is greater than everything. He's King of Kings. He's Lord of Lords. And he could actually live through us. And conquer those things. As if it was God himself walking down there. And tearing them down. Hallelujah. And that's what Joshua and Caleb caught. When they said God is with us. We are able and now, you know, we can say something more than God is with us. Christ is in us. Let's praise him. Hallelujah. Let's praise him. This is what I see. This is what I caught hold of as what God wants us to understand. Christ was actually in him. He was resurrected after he was crucified with Jesus. And we've got to grasp. And you're not just going to get this in a couple minutes. It's going to take time to change your way of thinking. But praise God. That's what we're all about, aren't we? Hallelujah. You ever hear that song? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Anybody know the rest of those words? I was trying to remember. I was going to get the lyrics. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? You remember, Elfie? Huh? Yeah, were you there? Laid him in the grave. I heard a preacher say this once, and it tickled, tickled me so much, and it's so true. Are you kidding? I participated. I was cru crucified with him. I was buried with him. It's not just he did it for me. It's as if God sees me as actually having died. And we need to see it the way he sees it. Because it just will revolutionize your life when you realize all of these things are true. So really, as a Christian... I, I can't see anything greater than this. The single most powerful revelation you can get as a believer is that God considers you to have been crucified with Jesus and that means you're buried with him and you're resurrected with him and you're seated with him. And Lot never grab hold of it because it's not something you can see. We look in the mirror. We see the same person. That looks similar to the guy that was before I was saved. And everything we see, there's not one thing about the power of the work of the cross that you can physically see. Even if you were there and you stood watching Jesus being crucified, you would not see what was actually happening in the spirit realm. You wouldn't see that it might as well have been every child that was ever born and raised on there with him. You wouldn't see that... When he made the statement, he tried to get it through. And it's like the disciples couldn't catch it. Did you ever notice when he talked about his resurrection? It's like they never really caught it. It's something they couldn't get. And 
I saw something in the spirit one day as the Lord spoke to me and said, just like they couldn't get his actual resurrection and couldn't accept it, my people aren't getting their spiritual resurrections now. They're not seeing it. But if you were there, you would not have known. Jesus said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. This he said concerning what death he should die. Think of it again. If I be lifted up the earth. I heard them sing praise songs. So let's lift up Jesus. Let's lift him up. Lift him up for because he said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. We'll see souls come in. So let's lift him up in praise. Yeah, you can do that, but that's not actually what he's saying. This he said, what death he should die. He'd be lifted up on that cross. And when he would be lifted up, it was like all of the human race was being considered to be dying with him. And here's another thing that's kind of gained some ground through the year. Have you ever heard of universalism? Nobody's lost. Nobody's going to go to hell. I'm telling you the bizarre doctrines that are coming out now. I heard one guy say, well, if you don't like Hitler, you better change your mind because you're going to see him in heaven. And it's like we're coming into dark, dark times. If possible, even the elect should be deceived. But um, Jesus died for everyone. But people who never get into that death, which we're going to show here in a sec, they can't benefit from it. It's there for them. The meal's prepared. Come and take it. But unless you come and take it and believe, it does you no good. Now, I actually know some people are going to be watching this video, and they don't, they don't believe that. They're going to hear that. That's how rampant this thing is out in this world. So when you see yourself the way you've always seen yourself, you're just a Christian now, you just go to church, and you'll handle your life the way that you used to handle it before you even had God. You'll worry about the same things, there won't be a difference. But if you can start arming your mind and realize, I died with him, I suffered in the flesh, and Peter said, they that have suffered in the flesh have ceased from sin. Oh my, we got to get to that point because that's, that's what it's all about. So, 2 Corinthians 5 and 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge. Everybody read these next few words with me. That if one died for all, then we're all dead. Read it that part again. If one died for all, then all were dead. You see how that's describing it? He did it for all of us. So guess what? God sees us all who have died. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. But here, that's not the point I really want to get at. Wherefore, henceforth, know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. We are completely changed. You wouldn't have seen that even if you were standing there watching Jesus crucified, but in the spirit realm, and you need the word of God to inform you. I can't show you a historical picture. If somebody had a video of him dying actually in video and we could look at it, it still wouldn't get it across. Everything that happened that's the most important things that happened was invisible to the naked eye because we were actually dying to sin on that cross with Jesus. We were dying to hell, to every bit of power. And where before we were saved, sin pushed us. Sin urged us. <clears throat> we couldn't resist it. Now we've got power over it. And if we don't understand that, sin is still going to push us around. Sin is still going to force us to do things. If you always had a bad temper, you still have a bad temper. You're not getting victory over it. And we try our best, but we're not getting there. Hallelujah. So, oh, hallelujah. I pray this gets through to us. I need a drink. <laughs> ah. And then he said in the same chapter, verse 7, we walk by faith, not by sight. So instead of thinking of yourself by what you see, 
You need to realize when you, Paul said it, when he said in 2 Corinthians 3 and 18, when you look in the mirror, think this way, you're looking at the glory of Jesus. You're looking at the glory of Jesus Christ as in a mirror. And you understand through the word of God, that's Jesus. He made me a new creature. I do not have to suffer with sin the way I used to. And, and you're going beyond just being in church. I'm free from hell. You're going beyond. I'm getting ready to, I'm, I'm going to be in heaven one day. You're right in the here and now being changed so that you're, you're having Christ come to live through you like he did through Paul. And you look at Paul. I mean, when this started getting a hold of me, it's like I had a bit of hero worship for Paul. It's like these kids now, they're superheroes. I looked at Paul. Wow. I even think they started catching on to that once and had Paul, superhero figurine once for the kingdom of God. But find out everything you can about what God says has changed in you and start believing it. Start, put an effort to let that soak in. Think about what he said is now different about you. And then figure out how that can change you. I want to apply this to me. I want to apply this. It's not going to take, a five-minute prayer won't do it. Reading a few verses every morning is not going to catch it. It's sitting down like we are here right now. Thank God for church. Thank God we can get into a place, get into that word, and have it explained so we can move into it. But watch this. Galatians 5 and 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery. Fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, sedition. There's only about nine fruit of the Spirit, but look how many works of the flesh we're reading about here. Envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I've told you in time past, they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. How many believers have struggled with things like this? And then we've got folks fussing with each other. They can't forgive. They hold a grudge. Jesus said, drop your rocks, drop your stones. None of you are without sin. Just drop your stones. And you've heard that statement. There's one thing I'm glad we see on the internet now and then is nice little inspired words from God. The only one that was worthy to throw a stone dropped it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And we get into fusses and we get upset. And after we read about that, look what he said in verse 24. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified their flesh with its passions and desires. He just lists these works of the flesh. And he says, if you belong to Jesus, you've crucified all of that. And folks, we need to start living the crucified life. Let me rephrase, the resurrected life. So in that light, what we're reading from here, the resurrection life is you're conquering all of that fussing and dividing and hating and jealous. Somebody once said, you're offended because your name wasn't mentioned so much in this issue? They said, yes, I'm offended. How could I not be offended? How can you not be offended? You're crucified with Christ to crucify offense. You're crucified with Christ to kill that stuff. People throw uh, slurs, insults, and hatred toward you, and it hurts you so much, you're dead to those things when you're crucified with Christ. And so we've really got to apply this and understand it in that light. And I, my, I remember some very close people in my family, before, when I was first getting saved, starting to see this stuff, I'd actually get ready, getting ready for Bible school, and I'd be up preaching every now and then and talk about this. I said, we got to stop getting upset with people. And then they finally made this statement, Mike, when you stop getting upset with people, then I'll believe you can, we can do that. And I said, I don't care if nobody going to church in the whole world has conquered that getting angry business. The Word of God says you can, and I believe it. Don't start counting heads to find out if a scripture's true or not by seeing if it happens in them. Amen? Start standing on the word. Don't look for somebody. Don't walk by sight. Walk by faith. Did the word of God say that those passions and lusts of our flesh are crucified with Jesus or didn't it? You see, this is what Paul, I'm building up to what Peter was getting at. One of the biggest truths we need to learn, somebody say for 2020, 
is that sin, it was far too powerful for us before we were saved. But Peter and Paul here in Romans 6 says that when you get baptized into the death of Jesus, it's his death that counts as your own. Watch this. Know you not and no wonder. Brother McLaren, he said, know you not. No wonder. He said, no. This is exactly what people don't know. And they can go church all their lives and never grasp this. You'll never see a truth in the Bible where Paul keeps repeating, don't you know as much as this one, that when you get baptized into Jesus, you're baptized into his death. And now see what the results and the conclusion of that means. Therefore, we're buried with him by baptism into death for this reason, so that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in such a new life that the things that used to be able to conquer us before don't conquer us anymore. Amen. And he comes right out with the real guts of it here in a moment. Somebody's saying newness of life, not sameness of life. And he's not just talking about, well, you don't swear anymore. Well, some Christians still swear. They need to give victory over that. Or it's, you don't get drunk anymore. I've known Christians, they still, some of them dabble in getting drunk. And, and all of this nonsense, but let's go deeper inside the heart now. You don't hate anymore like you used to hate. You don't get upset and offended anymore like you used to get up upset and offended. The newness of life is so new compared to the old, hallelujah, that it's the cross that made such a monumental difference in our lives. And he said, because if we've been planted together in the, in the likeness of his death, we shall, somebody say shall, it's yours. That is your promise. You shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. And now what he's going to do, and these, uh, this is my candy stick this morning, because these are one of the most powerful, enjoyable verses I've ever studied in the Word of God. Oh, I love this part of the Bible. He's now going to show us aspects of his resurrection that we have. And folks, we just haven't been enjoying it. Knowing this... He said, no, you're not. I'm going to tell you what to know now. You don't know something? Here's what you need to know. For, number one, your old man is crucified with him. You don't have to crucify him again. It's done. How many times did Jesus have to die on the cross? Once. Does he have to die every day? That's why when Paul said, I die daily, he's not talking about sin. We are crucified. We're not being crucified. We're not going to be crucified. We are crucified. Well, I know what I'm going to say, so I'm getting excited here. <laughs> that, why? So that this body of sin might be destroyed. That henceforth, we should not serve sin. Sin told us to do this, and we did it. Sin urged us to hate, and we hated. Sin in us is what makes us so touchy. Sin in us is what makes us so jealous and lustful. But he said, we get into his death so that that body of sin that's doing this to us can be destroyed so we don't serve sin anymore. That force cannot push you around unless you let it. And here's how we let it push us around. We don't really learn that. We don't take the time. I got to get this in me. I got to get it. I got to pray over these verses so I get the revelation. And old Uncle Willie used to say as he preached so much, got to get it from just being in your head down below your collarbone into your heart. Amen. We can quote it. We can quote it. We can quote it. But can we live it? And he said, he that is dead is freed from sin. He's not done, though. Now we're going to read descriptions of Jesus' resurrection to show us what we need to focus on and apply to ourselves. You're freed from sin. So if we be dead with Christ, somebody say, we be dead. Talk like the guy down the side, we be dead. We be dead. If we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Now, what we get thinking, I don't know, you're, you're showing me this giant and you're showing me me and, and you're not letting the guy, he's not letting you explain to him how you can fill that gap between them. But he said, it's too big, I can't see it. I just can't see it. No, because you never studied it. 
He never slowed down to read this. So you folks that want to go deeper with the Lord, this, this is where you need to focus. I'm getting it in my heart that I'm really dead with Christ. And that will all of a sudden explode something in my spirit that I know I can now live with him. I can understand it. Watch it. So you will live like him now. You're going to see what he experienced next. You're going to see and read where Paul says you've got the same blessing that Jesus has right now after his death because your baptism united you to his death. Now, is everybody experiencing the prayer I just prayed before I started preaching? We get focused here. Get focused. Listen closely. Don't miss this. Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dies no more. Right? He died once. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he lives unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also. First Paul said no. Everybody say no. Reckon and yield. Say it again. No. Reckon and yield. And what that means is first understand the facts. And reckon means now apply it to you. Reckon yourselves also to be dead unto sin. What's verse 10 say? Jesus died to sin once. And now verse 11 says, you are just as dead to sin as Jesus is. And you might say, well, how come I sin then now and then? Anybody ever sinned the last year? Not a one of you hypocrites, put your hand up. <laughs> we all did, didn't we? We sinned, didn't we? Well, what it, how could it say we're dead to sin as much as Jesus is if last year I committed some sins? Because we haven't reckoned it. We haven't reckoned this yet. This is when you reckon this. It's, one man said he got the revelation of this and he ran downstairs and he started hollering, I see it, I see it, I see it. What, what, what did you see? I see it. He said he was in a train and a bunch of them were gambling with some cards. They had three players. They needed a fourth man. And they said, hey, join us. We're doing a good game of gambling here. And this guy's a Christian. You know, I'm not going to gamble. But he says, no, I can't. Oh, my hands aren't with me. And they looked at his hands and they looked at him. Your hands aren't with you? And he actually preached them the gospel. These are instruments of his righteousness. I don't own them anymore. They're his. And I can't put them to this use. You see, he grasped it so much. Christ's living in me now. I'm dead. I got victory over that. He grasped. I see. I was actually on the cross in the spirit. I was buried and I'm resurrected. And just as much as Jesus is dead to sin, I am reckoned myself to be dead indeed. He just didn't say dead. He added that word indeed. <laughs> but, and just like Jesus is alive unto God now, after he liveth, we're alive unto God too. And everybody say it with me. Through... Jesus Christ. How did I die? Through Jesus. How was I buried with him? Through him. How was I resurrected? Through Jesus. How am I seated now in heavenly places when I'm standing in Sydney, Manitoba? Through Jesus. And that is just as real in the mind of God as real can be. And we've got to start thinking the way God does. Therefore, and this is what will throw you right off your feet if you're not getting this like he's actually saying it. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. Don't let sin make you jealous anymore. Don't let sin make you so touchy, make you so fussy like you used to be, make you so lustful, dra dragging you into porn on the internet. Talk about a wicked day we're in. You can get that stuff for free when no one's around you looking. And you can conquer that stuff. Conquer it. Because you're dead to it if you'll only accept what this is saying. And after I said no, after I said reckon, what was the third thing I said? Yield. 
That's where verse 13 comes in. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness and of sin, but now yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead. I've gotten it now, God. I finally see it. I am alive from the dead. And now when I go to you, I go to you because there are things, God, that you will only do for people that have died to sin. That's why sinners can't get a lot of the prayers answered. If I regard iniquity in my heart, he will not hear me. Let me repeat it. If I regard iniquity in my heart, he will not hear me. But if we died to sin and God took it out of, he killed it through Christ, when we go to God as those that are alive from the dead, I'll hear you. I'll listen to what you want. I'll empower you. And one time we were in a church service and I just started seeing this in Newfoundland in like 1992 or 91. And I was preaching. I said, go out of this church this morning and go hit this week and say, God, here I am. I am alive from the dead, but I'm giving you something else. What else does he say he's giving us? Yield yourselves unto God and your what? Members. Lindsay, if you can get ready on the piano. I'm giving you my hands, God. I'm giving you my mouth. I'm giving you my tongue. I'm giving you my feet. Use them like instruments of righteousness. This is where that guy said, I, I don't have my own hands with me anymore. They're for his work. And then believe what you pray for will come to pass. And then a woman came back that next Sunday. She said, I did what Pastor Mike said. I talked to God and said, use me, use me. Give me an opportunity. And she said it was arranged by God. It couldn't have been anything else. That I got into a situation and it was just the perfect time to talk to them about Jesus. And we try so hard to do something for God. We try our best. Oh, I, I got to be a witness. I got to be a witness. And then when we think about how many people we witnessed to over 2019, we might get discouraged and say, I didn't witness to enough. I should have witnessed. What if this was my last service? What if the trumpet should sound? And here we are standing before God. We're in the white throne judgment. And you can look as far as the eye can see and you can see souls all around you. And there's a throne up ahead. And then you move a little bit because somebody's just been judged and they've moved away. Now we're getting closer to our turn. And we're thinking, what could I have done more for God that I didn't do? And, and it can be condemning in a way. You can get thinking, oh man, 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 I don't, I'm not ready to stand before God now. What souls did I bring into the kingdom? And then the line moves and you move forward another few steps. Just enough step for one person because one person has just moved away from the throne. I don't know if that's the way it's going to happen. One at a time might take quite a while, wouldn't it? We do have eternity. <laughs> I don't know if you'll do it all at once somehow. I don't know. But I knew, do know this. I'm going to stand before him. But then when I stop and think, he hasn't come yet. 2020 is just over the corner. I am going to now go ahead into this year with an understanding I didn't have last year. Oh, I heard it preached. We heard it from the pulpit here. But I never really grabbed it because a lot of the same struggles I lived through in 2019, I lived through them before I was even saved. But now... I'm starting to buckle down here. I'm dead to this. I'm dead to this. And when you finally know it, I know it. I know, I know what he meant now. How many have heard that statement, I know that I know? You know it, but you even know you know it. <laughs> and then you reckon it to yourself. That's me. That's me now. Somebody say, I am in the equation. That's me. And that hits you like a ton of bricks. And then... You, wreck, you yield yourself to God now as that. You got it straight in your understanding. You applied yourself to it. And now you're going to come to God every time you come to God. Here I am, God. I'm alive from the dead. You can use me. And God sees that. You've taken the time to get that in your heart. You've prayed to finally get a revelation of that. Hey, my child, I'm so proud of you. I look at my kids and I'm so proud of Oh, Brandon right now has flown to California. He's working for a game company there and he's going to be there for a week. And, and Candace is a nurse. You know, and Amber, she's going to university. 
Bless God, I wish I could have gone to university. And Ian, it's like when my uncle first went down, he's my age and went down south. His uncle said to him, you scared? <laughs> so far away from home. And our son's living way down in Texas now, got a family, got some beautiful kids. And then to know that God looks down and is so proud. You're letting me live through you now. You understand it. It's not the imitation of Christ. It's me in you living through you. And you're catching that. And now, you know what it's like you can do this, child? Now when you face a problem like you faced last year, you can face it knowing you're carrying me around everywhere you go. And I'm ready and fixing to work through you. But you've never caught on to this, so I couldn't do it. It's like you tied my arms. I, I couldn't do it. You tried to do it yourself so many times. But now you realize this is a cooperative effort. I'm so proud of you, daughter. I'm so proud of you, son. Because now I'm going to roll up my sleeves and I'm going to roar like the Lion of Judah that I really am. And you are more than a conqueror through me. And those precious two words, through Christ, absolutely revolutionize our entire Christianity and will never be the same again. Oh, hallelujah. Let's all stand right now.